All right, well, welcome to tonight's Socratic Club debate. Um, as a reminder and to maintain the spirit of this occasion, we ask that people do not distribute flyers that are not from the Socratic Club. The Socratic Club was, oh. <laughs> Socratic Club was founded to provide a forum for the discussion of intellectual difficulties connected with religion and Christianity in particular. Our goal is to provide the OSU community with a venue for philosophical discussion and engaging debate. In doing so, we hope to maintain the long-standing tradition of free dialogue and a uh, genuine variety of ideas. Our debates in the past have been lively and engaging, and we expect no less tonight. Uh, tonight's debate will be separated into three sections. First, each speaker will present opening remarks for 20 minutes. Following this, we will allow each speaker a cross-examination period where they will ask questions about the position of the other speaker. Finally, we will open the debate to the questions uh, from the audience. So please refrain from asking questions until then. This evening's debate will explore the age-old question of whether God exists, with the two speakers presenting widely divergent <coughs> points of view. The discussion will focus on evidence for the existence or non-existence of God and what kind of supreme being, being is plausible. Michael Gurney will present a Christian point of view arguing the existence of a God who reveals himself in history and personal experience. Martin Ervig will present a somewhat divergent position arguing that there is insufficient evidence to infer the existence of God. Our first speaker tonight is Michael Gurney. Uh, Michael Gurney is a professor of theology and ethics at Multnomah University. He served in the U.S. Navy in the Navy uh, Naval Nuclear Power Program and on the USS Truxton before earning a BA in theology. He holds an MA in philosophy of religion and ethics and is currently a PhD candidate uh, in historical theology at Aberdeen University in Scotland. His academic interests focus on the interaction between philosophy, theology, and science. Uh, please join me in welcoming Professor Gurney. Good evening. I'm Mike Gurney, and I'll be arguing for the affirmative to the question, does God exist? Can you guys hear me to the back, okay? Okay. Uh, before I directly present my arguments for God's existence, I think it would be helpful to address a couple of preliminary issues. Uh, one is the fan. <laughs> uh, first, note that I did not say that I will prove that God exists. I do not think that I, nor anyone else for that matter, can prove God's existence. This is not due to weaknesses in the arguments for God's existence per se, but rather this has to do with the limitations of reason itself. As a philosopher, I would contend that there are very few knowledge claims that can rise to the threshold of proof. For example, I take that my belief that the external world is real it is a reasonable belief. In fact, I would go so far as to say that in the absence of epistemic defeaters, that is, arguments against it, for me to deny such a claim would be irrational. But can we prove that the external world is real? I think there are logically possible alternatives, like Hillary, uh, philosopher Hillary Putnam's thought experiment, or for you movie buffs, Matrix, uh, where we are really just brains in a vat, hooked up to a computer simulating so-called reality. The logical possibility of such a scenario cautions us in claiming to have proven that the external world is real. So what I will argue for tonight is that the belief in God's existence is rational. And I will even go so far as to claim that it is more rational to believe in God's existence than to deny or withhold belief in God. This leads to a second consideration, and that is the nature of faith. I reject Mark Twain's definition of faith as, quote, believing what you know ain't so, end of quote. Rather, I consider faith as an act of trusting someone or something. To trust someone or something who or which is not trustworthy is not an exercise in virtue, but foolishness. Furthermore, faith is not an act solely carried out by religious believers. Everyone, including atheists and agnostics, engage in acts of faith, and their very belief systems themselves rely on suppositions that often lack direct epistemic warrant. So the question then becomes for both the believer in God and those who reject God. Is the object of my faith reasonable? That is, 
Am I acting epistemically responsibly in placing my faith in whatever I take to be ultimate, whether that be God or something else? Can you guys hear it okay if I put it down? Can you get right up here? Yeah. Okay, I'm just trying to eat this thing. Uh, having said this, what I would like to do present in the short time that I have is an abbreviated cumulative case argument for God's existence that is built upon several well-known arguments for theism. My goal is to show that there are good epistemic grounds that make the theistic hypothesis, that is, God exists, more rationally plausible than the objections to and denials of the theistic hypothesis. <clears throat> Furthermore, I want to show that the faith of the theist is more reasonable than the faith of the atheist or agnostic. First, we can start with the question, why is there something rather than nothing? The Kalam cosmological argument attempts to answer that profound question by starting with the universe, and specifically the premise that the universe had a beginning. While I think this premise would have been very controversial some 50 years ago, most today in the scientific community, especially those in the fields of cosmology, astronomy, and astrophysics, would grant that there is strong empirical evidence for the universe having a beginning, particularly with the prominence of the inflationary hypothesis, otherwise known, otherwise known as the Big Bang. This then raises the question of whether the beginning of the universe was caused or uncaused. Let me offer a simple syllogism that I think demonstrates that the universe has to be caused. Premise one, all events have causes. Premise two, the beginning of the universe was an event. Conclusion, the beginning of the universe was caused. Now, if one wishes to deny the first premise, that all events have causes, the implications of such a denial would undermine the very foundation of modern science, in that science seeks after causal explanations. Another possible objection is to respond with, well, who caused God? But note again my first premise in the syllogism. All events have causes. First, I would deny that God is an event. Second, I would hold that this allows for the possibility of eternal objects, which by definition do not come into existence, and therefore require no causation. In fact, the theist's understanding of God is just that, God without beginning or end, and therefore uncaused. If I'm correct in this argument, then the beginning of the universe was caused. This then leads to the third stage of the Kalam argument, which is who, or what, caused the beginning of the universe. This can get into some rather tricky areas of metaphysics, namely agency or action theory. For simplicity's sake, let me suggest two mutually exhaustive possibilities, agent causation and event causation. To help illustrate the distinction between the two, I will use the example of the difference between Sally picking an apple from a tree and the wind blowing, causing the apple to fall from the tree. The former, an example of agent causation, is brought about by the volitions of the agent, Sally. The latter, event causation, obtains the exact moment all the necessary and sufficient conditions are satisfied. In this case, the forces of wind and gravity, which overcome the tensile strength of the apple stem, which leads to the event of the apple falling from the tree. Now note here that in the case of event causation, it is not a matter of there being some delay in the event of the apple falling. As soon as the combined forces of gravity and wind are stronger than the tensile strength of the apple stem, at that precise moment, not a moment sooner or later, the apple falls. Now if the event of the universe coming into existence is to be explained as a species of event causation, this raises the question of why did the universe come into existence some 12 to 14 billion years ago, or whatever time you happen to choose. If all the necessary and sufficient conditions are self-contained within the universe and have obtained in the universe's primal state for an infinite time prior to the Big Bang, then it would seem that the time of the origin of the universe would push back further and further at infinitum. If this conclusion of the Kalam cosmological argument is sound, then I think that such a conclusion leads itself to a belief in a personal God consistent with theism. If such a God exists, I take it to be reasonable to expect further empirical confirmation of such a God's existence. I would like to further develop and refine the case of God's existence by way of a cumulative argument from design. 
I, I should note here that there have been a number of arguments that appeal to apparent design in the universe that employ various rational method, methods and strategies. My particular argument relies on what is known as abductive reasoning, or inference to the best explanation. That is, given a theistic hypothesis, and comparing that hypothesis with a competing alternative, namely naturalism, we can ask which of these two, and we will, for the sake of simplicity, sidestep the other alternatives, which of the two best accounts for what we perceive and take to be real in our universe? First, I need to define the naturalistic hypothesis. A simple and succinct definition comes from Carl Sagan. Quote, the cosmos is all that is, or ever was, or ever will be. Sagan's definition can be supplemented by Bertrand Russell's naturalistic description of humanity. Quote, that man is the product of causes that had no prevision of the end they were achieving, that his origin, his growth, his hopes, his fears, his loves, his beliefs are but the outcome of accidental collocations of atoms. End quote. I think these two descriptions capture the central thesis of naturalism. All the features of the universe are to be explained by way of material and physical causes, thus no, re no need nor room for God. Now I'd like to examine these two competing hypotheses, deism and naturalism, with, ex with respect to their explanatory power in regards to human existence. Due to time constraints, I'm going to focus on human existence and one specific feature of that existence, the phenomenon of consciousness. I think that consciousness is an especially relevant con 